Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to do a movie review. I don't often do this on the channel, but I'm going to take a different approach to this. So there's going to be a lot of spoilers in this if you haven't seen the movie yet called How It Ends on Netflix. Uh, there's going to be a lot of spoilers in this video. So you may not want to watch this. You're definitely not going to want to watch this before you watch the movie because I'm going to be breaking it down scene by scene and talking about all the nuances of the film things you might not have noticed and we're going to try to extract whatever sort of lessons we can from this film with regards to what to do and what not to do in a crap hits the fan scenario what things they got right what things they probably got wrong or are questionable and a unique thing to this movie is that they don't tell you what the cause of the event which basically caused the collapse of civilization was so it's up to the viewer to decipher all the little Easter eggs and hints that they throw in about what might have triggered this event. So first off, my overall opinion of this movie is that it was pretty good. I would probably give it like a 6.7 out of 10. It was very watchable. Uh, I found myself wanting to keep watching it, which is good. I think it covered most of the scenarios. I think when you only have a two hour TV show, there's not a lot of room to go into great depth, especially when you have shows like The Walking Dead that go into incredible depth, even though that's a much more fictitious scenario. And this one, arguably, if we knew what it was, is a bit more plausible. But it seems to be a mishmash of all apocalyptic events rolled up into one, with the exception of a large-scale pandemic. But we'll talk more about that as the video goes on. So we have Forrest Whitaker, who plays the ex-military, more preparedness-minded individual. He's actually the soon-to-be father-in-law to Theo James, who in the film is appropriately named Will Younger. That's going to become more apparent because... Uh, Forrest Whitaker takes on a paternal role in this movie and in that way it's very much like the movie The Road in the sense that you have a father uh, taking his son and in this case not his biological son but somebody under his wing his apprentice taking him through this uh, post collapse world and basically teaching him how to be a man teaching him how to be self-reliant teaching him street smarts so you have this theo james guy you know he's a businessy type fella from an urban environment kind of living on a whim doesn't really have a lot of big plans for the future you know he had a baby out of wedlock with forrest whitaker's daughter liberal in some of his beliefs uh, along the lines of guns as we'll see later on in the show and they are kind of polar opposites and in the beginning of the film he's visiting the parents and Forrest Whitaker and him get in an argument and uh, Forrest goes on a rant about how you know the kids nowadays you guys don't appreciate anything you don't have to work for anything stuff that we as preparedness minded individuals can appreciate and I'm sure a lot of the older generation uh, shares in those criticisms towards the younger generation nowadays that that a lot of them have never had to experience the hardship that comes with desperation and not having your base level needs met food water shelter safety security a lot of people live in this bubble where the extent of their problems are social problems and mental problems they have that luxury to be preoccupied with those sorts of things so anyways it ends with them getting in an argument and basically hating each other the next morning the guy wakes up he's talking to uh, Forrest Whitaker's daughter on the phone she's in California he's out in the east like New York Chicago I'm not sure what city he was in and while they're concluding the phone call all of a sudden you hear this rumble on her end in the background and she starts freaking out and she loses the connection with him and, you know, we're to presume that there was something that had happened there, probably an earthquake or, you know, a nuclear bomb. Nobody really knows at this point. Anyways, he rushes to get a flight out of there. And it's important to note that at this time, he still has cell reception, but she doesn't. So he rushes to the airport. He's watching this uh, news report on television. Anytime you watch a movie and they have the news come on and they have the marquee rolling on the bottom and it's you know giving you all these other little pieces of um fic fictitious news to make it seem realistic it's interesting what they put on those ticker reels like for instance in this one it says death toll rises in european heat wave so clearly what they're doing there is they're trying to 
suggest or implicitly unconsciously embed in your psyche that this may be something that's man-made related to global warming type thing so they're they're putting that in your brain right there lots of people won't even notice that but that certainly was a thing that was there and the bottom part of the ticker here it says investigation proceeds with new accusations coming in from officials about president putin and trump's uh collaboration that's what the whole message had said basically and which is funny because you know this movie was probably made earlier in the year and it's oddly prescient in some ways and of course the conspiracy minded amongst us might suggest that this is some kind of predictive programming or it's just the norm nowadays it's just what we would have expected and you know they managed to really hit both of these things bang on but the implications with this easter egg is that it may be man-made conflict related or it might be environmental so after that the tv shuts off everybody's kind of dumbfounded doesn't know what's going on so will decides to head back uh, through the city manages to catch a cabbie somehow and uh, at this point all the power is off apparently not the small scale electronics and that's important to note so we can rule out any sort of nuclear detonation over the united states because that e1 pulse of the mp would have blown out some electronics and that doesn't seem to be the case. So he heads back to the apartment and sure enough, Forrest Whitaker is packing his bug out bag. He's got himself a 5.11 tactical backpack, uh, same backpack that I've owned for many years, which I find kind of cool. They paid a little bit of attention to detail, except for this really old school crappy mag light that looks like it runs on two D batteries or some crappy thing like that. Uh, we have the flyby of two F-18s or F-22 Raptors possibly and uh so that signifies right there that this may be military related maybe related to some international conflict but that's just one of those things they threw in there to try to throw people off a little bit so already the preparedness minded one forrest whitaker has taken on the responsibility of saying look we got to get out of dodge as soon as possible because you know the implication is the roads are going to be jammed and the longer you wait uh, the harder it's going to be to get out and will younger he's still pretty naive to everything that's going on here he's thinking that you know maybe we should wait for another flight or wait at the airport for the power to come back on or something like that but uh forest is pretty wise to the fact that you know if there was a major calamity out west power is out throughout the entire country chances are crap has hit the fan and we got to get rolling so he leaves his wife, which I found kind of surprising, but apparently she had a safe place to go to. But they part ways rather unceremoniously. What I mean by that, there was no, you know, I'll love you forever type thing. So they don't set him up to die. Like it's not that obvious that he's going to die, even though he is going to die. Uh, they don't set it up like that, which there wasn't a lot of closure with this relationship. If you're planning on traveling across the country and you know that it's probably full-blown shtf maybe you shouldn't leave your wife in the city i know he thought he was leaving her in a safer place but being ex-military for 27 years in the marines he has to understand human nature a bit better than that and know that society by the time he gets back has going to be already descended into unrecognizable chaos but he presses on anyways and they head out now we get some aerial shots here which show us how crowded the roadways are. So the fact that they were able to get out of the city at all is a miracle. This should be one of the biggest lessons to people is that getting out of the city is probably going to be one of the hardest things you do. If at all possible, if you can have a vehicle waiting outside the city somewhere in a secret place on a friend's acreage or in the suburbs in the very least and you can get to that place either by bike or by foot that's probably your best bet because most of these vehicles that you see here are going to get stuck in traffic and this is another indication that it wasn't an electromagnetic pulse because we know that at least one in 20 of these vehicles will probably be disabled to a point where they're not going to run without some sort of mechanical intervention. Contrary to popular belief, all the vehicles on the road are not going to be fried in the case of EMP. It's actually going to be a relatively small 
amount. But regardless, 1 in 20 of these vehicles that you're seeing in these aerial shots here, if 1 in 20 of them were stalled, just imagine what it's like on the freeway when there's one accident with one car that's blocking traffic. How much that can back up traffic on rush hour. Now imagine rush hour times 10 in that everybody who has a car is on the road trying to get out of Dodge. It's going to be absolutely impossible. My advice is to not even bother. You're going to get probably a couple blocks and you're going to have to abandon your car or you're just going to end up sitting there wasting precious time. There's lots of back roads you can use. Uh, you can use the train tracks. You can use the grid roads, the back alleys. You want to think unconventionally. You don't want to think of what's the fastest way out because everybody's going to be thinking what's the fastest way out. Really, you're going to want to be thinking about what's the slowest but surest way out. But if you're in a town where you're dependent on bridges to get places, then you're probably in a lot of trouble. Now, we get another indication here that satellite navigation is not available. So they try to use their cell phones. Cell phones don't work. GPS also doesn't work. Remember, the GPS network is independent of the phone networks. So what this is telling me then is that, you know, this this could be a variety of things. This could be a cyber attack uh, or it could be a solar flare, a coronal mass ejection. It could still be an EMP that wasn't close enough in proximity to where they are to have coupled into their smaller electronics, but that's yet to be seen. But I think the likelihood of high altitude electromagnetic pulse at this point is pretty unlikely considering there's so many electronics, so many vehicles running and all the rest. Now, this is where the crap starts to hit the fan. So they go to get gas and they somehow manage to make it to the pump. And it seems pretty chaotic, but there's not a lot of honking. There's not a lot of people freaking out. You know, they're taking cash still. So this is an indication too. There's going to be a few stages of the economy you know it's first it's going to be cash if there is still electricity people probably will still take credit and debit cards but once that's gone of course it's going to be cash then you're going to move into a barter economy where you're bartering for things that people would still lust after knowing that the grid was coming back and then you're going to enter the final stages of the post collapse economy or the beginning stages if you will really and that's when you're starting to barter in things people actually need food water ammunition uh, things that are essential and my personal opinion i wouldn't barter ammunition unless you really needed to barter ammunition so it's important to remember that everything they put on screen in a movie because there's so limited time to make these movies everything they put on screen is significant for the film overall so the change of hands here of the money this is kind of the barometer of civilization right here once people stop accepting money you know that get things are getting real real bad now here's a common thing that's been used throughout the ages you know baiting guys with women uh, i don't think this was really necessary how they do it but she comes over to will who's pumping the gas meanwhile forrest whitaker who i'm just going to call the dad from now on i'm going to call will the son the son's pumping gas then this little floozy walks over and she's trying to, you know, start some stuff with them saying, oh, why are you harassing me? These two other little jokers who look like they weigh a combined total of 200 pounds and are lit on meth or something like that or trying to get lit on meth uh, start threatening to smash up the car if they don't give them the gas and give them what they have. And the son is really ready to forfeit over what they have in spite of the fact that this might be their only way to get out west at this point without having to rob somebody else and you know dad comes in he keeps it real he ain't taking none of this he, he's ready for this you know 27 years in the marines he's got this on lock so these petty marauders they scurry instantly and the dad then shows his disappointment with the son who was basically willing to you know give up their only means of commute and they have a little argument and the son's all bothered by the fact that he had a gun. So his whole naivete around the use of firearms and self-defense, personal security really manifests. You know, he's been in this nanny state bubble his entire life. Probably grew up in a pretty decent neighborhood. Never had to worry about much. So he has absolutely no street smarts. That's how they're trying to paint it. And of course, Pops is trying to teach him uh, the, the ways of the road, so to speak. So anyways, they come across this military checkpoint. They manage somehow to make it to the front of the military checkpoint. They do this all in a day. Just the fact that they were able to get out of the city 
and make it to the interstate in a day is freaking amazing because by the looks of things that city shouldn't have been moving anywhere so he sweet talks the uh the soldier there into letting him pass and you know this might work but um i i think you would have to show them some kind of proof that you were a marine and i really don't know if it would work then maybe they could but this is probably one of the reasons why you want to avoid the major highways is because that's where the major blockades would be so we've seen it in a couple places already now this is the third place where they're showing us the military hinting at the fact that there may be some form of international conflict going on although this sort of martial law would likely be implemented in any sort of scenario but it's certainly starting to seem like something's going on now now i don't know how plausible of a scenario this is i could see them wanting to blockade a city in the case of a pandemic because you know they, they wanted to stop the spread or slow the spread but i'm not sure how long a containment of this sort would last in a metropolitan area but something like this would take a lot of military resources to have to do this for every city because it's not just going to be one city they're going to do this to they're going to want to do it to all the cities and obviously they want to keep the highways clear for whatever sort of reason they might want to keep them clear maybe they need them for military purposes for transporting military equipment who knows what the case is but clearly they want everybody locked into the city where those people can be controlled i don't think in a situation like this they would have the manpower to see that through for very long before people really started to turn on the army so anyways he talks his way onto the interstate and i think this is how they explain the wide open roads in the movie a lot of people have criticized the movie painting it as unrealistic because you know they basically drive from one end of the country to another only seeing a few people on the road and i guess the idea is everybody's landlocked in the cities by the military so they basically have a free reign on the road which i don't think is very plausible once again we see a military train passing by here with tanks and humvees and all the rest so just the fact that there's tanks on the train makes me think that this may be some sort of international conflict they're looking at because you know for domestic purposes i don't think they would have to bust out the tanks at least i don't think so uh, i think it would uh, the humvees i could see maybe the personnel carriers but i can't really see them you know wanting to use tanks on the domestic population things would have to be pretty bad for that to happen or the other possibility is is that they're just preparing their defenses in the case of a military invasion which another country might exploit this disaster as the united states has become weakened now so some opportunistic nation might use that as an opportunity to invade that's another possibility so things continuously devolve they're driving down the road at night they pass a sign that says maximum prison security area do not pick up hitchhikers sure enough uh, a cop car pulls them over and this should be another lesson for people if you know that there's a national definitely a national but possibly an international crap hit the fan scenario going on and some cop pops out of nowhere uh, no headlights or anything like that trying to pull you over uh, don't get out of the car and run towards the guy all naive like the son does. Of course, the dad sits tight because he's a lot more suspicious. The son runs out. Oh, I'm going to go and John Wayne this stuff. And sure enough, it's an escaped prisoner who had stolen the police uh, state trooper car. And uh, he has a shotgun trained on him. And then a little bit of action transpires. Eventually, dad kills the guy. They take the cop car. Then they wind up on a Native American reservation, which is something you really got to pay attention to they do a lot of little things like this in this movie that unless you really think in depth about the metaphor that they're trying to get across you're going to miss quite a bit so when they come into this uh reservation town unlike the city where people are you know in a scurry everybody's going crazy people are already looting and robbing from one another uh the res is just the res you know it hasn't changed much everybody's just kind of living their life uh, the res has always been a hard place to live for a lot of aboriginal people and so not much has changed it's just another day out there and they run into this young girl who happens to be a mechanic says she can fix the car blah 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 do you want to come with us okay and there's a scene where the young son is looking in the mirror and he's reflecting on his mortality he sees blood from his head and he realizes now that you know this uh crap is getting real and i got to start taking 
life seriously. Things are changed now. This is the point where he acknowledges the gravity of the situation. They give us a little bit of a background on the young girl who comes with them. You know, she's clearly from an abusive household with an alcoholic father. And then they go to a scene where a bunch of the local Aboriginal people, they're all sitting around listening to a radio broadcast. Everybody's pretty calm and collected. I really think they're trying to communicate some subtle messages here because the only one who's really freaked out and looks like they don't know what they should do next is the son. Remember, he's from the city, right? And all these people from the res, you know, they're used to living in abject poverty, not having much. And their ancestors, of course, lived off the land. And I almost get a sense that what they were trying to communicate with this scene, when you've seen all the somber looks on the locals' faces, it's almost a look of, you know, like, we knew this was going to happen. We knew that this was going to be the end result of this civilization. Now, that, of course, implies that this was somehow man-made. But that's the vibe I got from this scene to them, their livelihood ended hundreds of years ago when the buffalo were destroyed. Uh, this is kind of just the final nail in the coffin, so to speak. That's that's the vibe that I sort of got from them. And of course, you know, the frantic young millennial guy who's straight out of the mass media brainwashing factory is just dumbfounded, doesn't know what to do. And then he notices that all these starlings are acting up. And one of the locals says, oh, I've never seen them do that before. So this is showing us that, well, maybe it is something geographical once again. So they're kind of confusing us. They're showing us the military stuff. Now they're showing us this geographical stuff. Nature is going wild, uh, indicating that maybe there is something to do with uh, the poles. Maybe the poles are shifting or there's some kind of geomagnetic storms, maybe heavy tectonic activity. Some caldera is going to blow God only knows, but they're really trying to throw us a lot of curveballs here. We also find out in the next scene that Forrest Whitaker has bruised his ribs. And of course, that eventually will spell his demise. Now, one cool thing that he does before they hit the road from the res. So he takes some duct tape and he puts it over the taillights and the brake lights, which I thought was a pretty cool idea. I, I would have never thought of that, at least... Uh, not before crap hit the fan and before I necessarily needed to do that. So that's a good thing to know. I suppose you could also just uh, take off the taillight, pull the lights out. That'd be a bit simpler, but then you would lose all functionality. So you might not want to do that. Or you could just pull the fuse, which controlled that. But in doing so, you might also cut off some other functions of that fuse circuit. So I thought that was a good tip. I always get one or two things from these movies. Usually only one or two now because I've seen almost every apocalyptic movie there is to see. And then the next couple scenes, they really milk it. They see somebody ahead and they basically follow them at a safe distance using their lights to guide them. So while they're driving down the road, they pull out a compass and they notice that the compass is spinning really wildly. So I guess you could chalk one up for pole shift here. Because I don't know what else would explain a compass spinning that widely. Unless they were happen to be passing through an area of geographical magnetic significance. Not much really comes of that scene. And so they pull over. They're gassing up on the side of the road. And the young native girl and the son are talking about the dad. And how he can kind of be a bit of a hard ass sometimes. And she just basically looks at the son and says, you know, you don't know what hard is, man. Like that, that guy's not hard at all. So they're really trying to set the character boundaries here. You know, she knows hardship. She's been a survivor her entire life. He has never had to really survive like he has to now. And for him, anybody who gives him any direction is quote unquote hard to deal with. For her, the bar of emotional, mental, physical abuse has been set so high that this pales in comparison to that. I've talked about this at length before, about how people who've endured a life of hardship and poverty, it's going to be just another day in crap hits the fan, really. Like if you live in one of the worst neighborhoods in your town where you can get shot, you know, going to the store in the middle of the night, you already kind of are in a without rule of law, crap hits the fan scenario to an extent. So you're not going to have to adapt as much. The sun has a lot of adapting to do to this new world. She really doesn't. Now, here again, they just keep dropping the hints on us as to what's going on. There's this major lightning storm that the native girl says she's never seen anything like that before. 
And you know, there's a lightning strike in the power line, money shot, all the rest. They're really playing up this idea that this may actually be something geological here. And so uh, in the next set of scenes, on the next day, they stumble into what looks to be reminiscent of the town of Jericho. If anybody's never seen that TV series, it's a post-apocalyptic TV series about what happens in small towns. And I think this is going to be a pretty accurate depiction. You know, the townsfolk in a lot of these rural communities are going to be turning a lot of people away. And the people who come to call the shots in these communities are probably going to be the local law enforcement, the sheriffs, maybe certain elected officials. But they are really going to try to maintain control. And a lot of people are going to continue to listen to them, particularly in these tight-knit communities where everybody knows each other. So there's this anthropological concept called Dunbar's Number. It shows in the absence of, you know, civilization, communities can only grow so big and function in a way which is not going to be self-destructive. So I think that's why, you know, the, the rebirth of civilization after an event like this would have to come from these small towns who already had these organic relationships formed beforehand to foster the trust and the communication that's going to be required to rebuild society so anyways they have a hard time getting in but they eventually are able to get into the town because he knows somebody who lives there he goes he visits some of his frantic friends in town you can see here they they just sort of pan quickly across the table showing cell phones and all these cell phone batteries so she's been frantically trying to call family members outside of the town and has had no luck maybe they're showing here that there was an e1 pulse and that is basically the part of the electromagnetic pulse from a high altitude explosion that would fry small scale electronics and that this woman was frantically trying out all these different phones because maybe they were all fried who knows maybe we're now that we're getting closer to the middle of the country closer to the epicenter of where a rogue nation may want to detonate a high altitude nuclear weapon just some food for thought so now here they also show a scene where they show a downed airplane now the characters are debating whether or not it was shot down or whether it just fell out of the sky and it makes you wonder now because we just seen that scene with the cell phones are they saying that there is some electromagnetic interference which is causing the failure of electronics once again it's inconclusive because they never really tell you now they make another hint at global warming they distinctly pan the camera to show the guy turning up the air conditioning and many times throughout the movie they're commenting on how hot it was in fact the scene just before this when they're in the town of jericho uh, the woman says come inside it's too hot out here hinting at the fact that things are really starting to warm up now once they split that town they're driving down the road and it looks like they see this water park and uh, this aboriginal girl really you know looks enthused about going there but it was the dad who actually suggested that they go there and look for supplies. But for me, they're trying to do some character development with her, you know, showing how she never really had a childhood, never really got to experience a lot of these things that she's wanted to get off the reservation for a long time, but wasn't able to. And now she has this experience. So she goes and she runs into the water. And once again, they do a reference to the temperature and she says, oh, that's really hot. And she runs out screaming and the guys start laughing and they actually have a good laugh about it at her expense, of course. But it's the first time where they all sort of let loose and bond a little bit. So they look up at the sky, they see this helicopter passing by and the native girl, she comments on, oh, how it's uh, Apache or something like that. And they said, oh, how do you know that? And she just said, oh, I don't really know. But she makes a comment about how a lot of military equipment is named after tribes that uh, the military once conquered like tomahawk missiles you know things of that nature and that's where I, I really can appreciate this movie because they put in a lot of depth in the dialogue and the subtext that you don't see in a lot of movies like this so that's why i think the critics might have been a little harsh on this movie because what we're really starting to see here is that animosity that i told you so between the original colonized people of the land and the colonizers whose civilization is now collapsing. But this helicopter once again harkens back to the idea that this may be something of a militaristic nature going on. So as they're driving down the highway at nighttime, you start seeing these uh, sparks 
flying through the power lines towards them. This current that's flowing. So to me, this would be something which might happen in the case of a geomagnetic storm. Because you're going to have these pulses, these waves of energy coming in and coupling into the larger power grid, the larger power lines. And so for me, that's what potentially is happening here. I think this is a really good indication that what we're seeing might be the result of some kind of solar activity because they're saying it's getting hotter. In fact, during the Carrington event, which was a solar flare event that happened in the late 1800s, uh, it was reported that different telegraphs would actually work without a power source, that there was so much energy in the air uh, while that event was occurring. So it's very likely that something very similar was happening here. So it's hard to say. And as they're passing through this area, they do get some cell reception. And they do actually get a message from Samantha who tried to call them. So there is still some connection. It's kind of spotty. And then they're driving down the road a little further. And they see all these people who are heading out of what looks to be a region which is stricken with uh, forest fires. We don't really know what the cause of the fires is though. That's the thing. Was it a forest fire or was there some kind of meteor? Was was it bombed? We don't really know what happens here. And so once again, they're not really telling us what's going on. This for all we know could have been the result of an earthquake. It was one of the many, many subtleties of this movie that you're going to take for granted if you don't watch it closely. So anyways, these guys try to rob them of gas and the native girl has to basically ride shotgun and she shoots them and their car flips over and she basically causes them to die and she can't handle this. She's freaking out because in some ways she's become that which she's been criticizing all along. You know, she's just another person who now is out for herself, uh, taking from the land as much as possible at any expense, at everybody's expense. So she can't handle that. So she basically splits town. But she says before she she leaves that, you know, I'm going to survive this no matter what. But basically, I'm not too sure if you two are going to survive it, which, you know, I got to hand it to her. She's probably right about that. Now, in the next set of scenes, they come across that what appears to be the same train that they seen earlier, which was heading out west. So they were sending this military equipment out west because that's the direction they're driving in. And it looks like it was either derailed. Maybe it was shot down. Who knows? But we do know that in the last town, there everything was on fire and set ablaze. So for all we know, there was some sort of attack on that town. And this really is like a prepper's wet dream to come across a military train like this in which there's nobody around and you got Humvees on there. You got God knows what probably loads of ammunition enough ammunition to ride out 10 apocalypses in there so they go and buddy goes uh looking at the place you can see the tanks on there and if you don't look carefully you won't see the corpses on the ground there so it's like and they really pan over this a few times getting you to think about what it might have been that caused this so it almost seems as though they're, they're trying to suggest that this may have been something which was caused by a military strike or a missile or it was intentional perhaps who knows maybe somebody set it up so they could get all the, the goodies but uh, buddy decides that it's a good idea to only take a couple canisters of gas and he heads back to the truck and they basically abandon this gold mine of stuff now granted they're going across the country to find his wife but I mean come on man you can't just leave all of that stuff and I for one would be very tempted to take a Hummer although that wouldn't be a very gray man thing to do and you may stick out so that's a dilemma you're going to be faced with maybe at some point is you know do I choose the tactical or do I choose the gray man approach the tactical is going to be a lot more capable you're going to have a lot more firepower with that but you're not going to have the concealment factor which may be the thing that allows you to avoid confrontation making the Hummer more problems than it's worth anyways here we start to really see the degeneration of Forrest Whitaker He's starting to cough a lot. He can't breathe. He has a collapsed lung. So they have to allow some airflow into his lungs. So they stick him with a, one of those airflow needles. And he comes back to life for a little bit. So the son now is really starting to have his manhood tested. 
he's got to take up the reins. He's got to do all the footwork because uh, the dad's kind of just the guy sitting in the back of the car telling him what to do at this point. So he's a, basically about to die and they start having this uh, love-in where they're bonding and they're sharing stories. And there's a part where he says some sentimental things that makes uh, the dad know that he's going to be a good provider for his daughter and that he can now die in peace and blah 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 come down the road where i think we're coming on the fourth or fifth day of the chaos here and they quickly pan over the horizon here and if you can see there's actually a power plant in the distance there i'm not sure what kind of power plant it is but clearly you can see that there's lights on there there's activity there so they're showing us that some places still have an active power grid now they don't see exactly where this is i know there are some states in the united states who actually have protection mechanisms in place to mitigate the effects of electromagnetic pulse so anyways they're crossing this bridge and we get some more shoot 'em up stuff going on here there's a well-organized group of daft punk wannabe marauders on dirt bikes of all things who want to try to loot their stuff and you know if you're on a dirt bike uh, here's an idea for you don't chase a car if you're on a dirt bike and it's crap hits the fan you're gonna lose that battle nine times out of ten I don't know what the hell these guys have in their minds thinking that they're gonna run into a car but but anyways the dirt bikes get skunked and Forrest Whitaker does his one last good deed for the Sun he shoots uh, a vehicle and it explodes that whole Hollywood cliche accident sequence and basically right after that he dies uh, the car runs out of gas and the guy that they're, they're always putting these hints into this movie with the power grid he looks to the horizon where the sun's setting there and you can see the power grid in his way towards there so they're, they're trying to send us something and there wasn't any electricity flowing through this grid at this point in the movie or anything like that but they're really putting this in our face for some reason so he torches the car and that really is the end of his training he's now a full-blown jedi and he has to carry the force across the galaxy now he's passed as he's walking down the road by this hunter on a quad who just kind of minds his own business now this is day six so they're already showing how people are already starting to rely on harvesting wild game to meet their needs nature's grocery store Clearly his quad hasn't run out of gas yet, but it certainly soon will. He runs into another guy with a family and this shows him that, you know, humanity is still alive. And this really is like that scene in the road where at the end of the movie, the boy uh, makes the encounter with the other family after his dad has passed away. So they pick him up. They basically take him a little further across the country. Now they say that they they're heading north. Because something to do with the air quality is better in Canada. So yay for us, I suppose. But little do they know, it's going to be really freaking cold in a couple months. And they're probably not going to survive up there. But, you know, whatever. Let them have their run to Canada fantasy while it lasts. So they say they're going to take them west as far as they can before taking a hard right to the great north. And he agrees, gives up his gun, you know, has a little bit of trust there with the guy. But I guess coincidentally... They're able to go to his real dad's house, his biological dad. And this is after Forrest Whitaker has passed away. And of course, his dad isn't there. His dad is nowhere to be found. Once again, this is talking about how, you know, the millennials, they lack a father figure. And that's what the paternalization by Forrest Whitaker was all about. And now it's just him and this uh, stranger family that he's with in the house. And he is now the man of the house, so to speak. So anyways, he uh, starts packing up. I thought this scene was going to be confrontational where he's packing up all the supplies. I thought that him and this guy were going to get in a scrap about, you know, who gets to, to have what. But it was pretty amicable how it turned out. The, the guy gave him the car in exchange for them being able to stay at the house and have all the food, which is going to turn out to be a bad decision because while all this is going on, as they get closer to the west... They increasingly are feeling more and more of these earthquakes, meaning that they're heading into a pretty sketchy situation. Now, the guy only has one bullet left. He hightails it all the way to Seattle. He's finally made it to the coast, which has been totally destroyed. And you can see some like pyroclastic flow going on there in the background, which appears to be, you know, 
probably some kind of volcanic activity, ring of fire type activity. And he goes right into the zone. He manages to find a fire truck which has a working respirator in it. Now he does notice when he's passing by, walking by all these abandoned cars on the road, he sees someone in the car who appears to just be a stiff. They appear to be dead. So how this person died is unknown. And you see that they distinctly wanted you to try to figure out why this guy had died. What killed this guy? You know, was it the lack of oxygen in the air? Was it the heat? I mean, it looks like he's a little dark, but he doesn't appear to be burned. It looks like he's just died. So who knows why that might be the case. Uh, we get another shot of the totally destroyed Seattle here. And of course, he just willy-nilly walks into town, uh, somehow manages to find his girlfriend's place in all this rubble, which I think is just an absolute, I mean, come on. Like, really, you're just going to, you know, strut into Seattle from a couple miles out through this post-apocalyptic hellhole and somehow be able to know which street your girlfriend lives on. And there just happens to be a ladder that's going up to her window and she just happened to write something on the wall telling him where she is going to be. You know, she's one of the few of millions of people who managed to somehow get out. So she has bugged out to some cabin in the woods. And there she was with uh, a neighbor, I guess. And uh, they had bugged out to this cabin together. And so this guy is pretty jealous of Will. And what you need to know is that she right now is pregnant with Will's kid. But he doesn't actually know that yet. He thought that that was just going to be his post-collapse concubine and that they were going to make lots of babies and ride out the apocalypse into the sunset with one another. But, of course, Will comes back. Uh, they re-fall in love once again. But he gets really pissed off. You can see in the background there, he ain't, he ain't liking this too much. But it's a tough thing for him to swallow right now, but he's going to be civil about it for the time being. So then they start talking about blah, 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 blah. And uh, he goes to sleep and he wakes up in the middle of the night and he comes outside and he sees the Aurora Borealis uh, shining pretty brightly in the sky there. And so this once again is indication of some sort of geomagnetic aspect. It could just be the usual northern lights. I'm pretty sure you can still see them from Seattle at times. So it could just be that. But I don't think they would be that pronounced. And clearly they want us to see this in the movie. So they're suggesting that it has something to do with what's going on. So he notices that his girlfriend, wife, whatever you want to call her, is sitting with this guy around the fire. And so they get to talking about what happened. And they mention in there that, you know, it happened really fast. They don't really go into detail about what happened really fast. They just said that within 15 minutes, you know, crap had hit the fan and everybody was hitting the pavement. Then Buddy goes off on a bit of a conspiratorial rant about what he thinks happens. So basically his theory in a nutshell is that this was something militaristic in nature that some nation had attacked them under the guise of a geological event. So what he's suggesting is that they used, you know, maybe nuclear weapons under the ocean to trigger some sort of massive earthquake and tsunami in conjunction with some sort of computer virus to shut down the power grid throughout the entire country. And he makes a good point to Will, who we still are seeing is still very naive to what's going on, because uh, Will immediately reacts. And I think this is a very important scene, because Will immediately reacts with contempt towards this guy, who clearly has a different viewpoint on things, just like he's been programmed by the mass media not to consider any sort of alternative explanations to things. So he immediately becomes very defensive and says, man, you're crazy. Like this could never be happening. What makes you think that you have this uh, esoteric knowledge and blah, blah, blah. And it really appears as though he's disproportionately upset, more so than he should be when a guy's just basically floating an idea. Now, while this guy isn't wrong to think and hypothesize about these things, uh, you also need to remember that this is how cults are going to start by trying to provide explanations of what has happened to people who are seeking those explanations. In times of great struggle, people are going to be looking for direction and someone who appears to have confidently figured it out. But the vehement denial on the on Will's part, the son's part of what this guy's saying 
is really a metaphor for how most people respond when they're presented with alternative viewpoints in modern society nowadays. Because Will doesn't even consider why uh, all of this has happened. He's still, you know, thinking about, well, we got to live with it. He's not thinking about, and he explicitly states that, that, you know, we got to live with it no matter what happens. So basically, who cares? So it's just kind of who cares millennial mentality seeping in once again. For some reason, this guy doesn't seem to be stricken with that. So right then and there, there's a bit of animosity, a bit of tension between those two. And then he sees him at his car in the morning. And they don't really ever explain what he was doing with the car. Because eventually they hightail out of there into the sunset. Uh, and after Will kills this guy. Because he of course tries to kill him. Uh, tries to lure him out into the forest and that whole line. The duality between these two for me seemed a bit rushed. Because there really wasn't a bad guy in this movie uh, up until this point. And it almost plays out as if this guy has been in the movie the whole time. And really he's only been in the movie for like five minutes before he dies. So Will kills him and basically, you know, the crap starts to hit the fan. They just make it out in time. That whole we're going to get out of Dodge at the very last minute thing. And then they roll the credits and that's it. But before they roll of credits, uh, you can see here the ash clouds getting really close to them. But right before the credits roll, you can actually see them start to pull ahead of the ash cloud. Indicating that, well, maybe they're going to make it. They're going to be safe. Maybe there's going to be a sequel to this. It doesn't seem like one of those movies where they're going to make a sequel, but they may. And I hope they do because I thought it was fairly decent. I thought it was fairly plausible in terms of the timelines of how the events played out. You know, over the course of seven days, basically civilization had collapsed. It's fairly consistent with the idea of nine meals away from anarchy. After seven days, you know, society has devolved. There are some communities of law and order as they demonstrated. I would say it's a fairly accurate depiction. I don't think many of the action scenes were too over the top. Like the movie 2012, that was almost a comedy, really. Because it was so implausible in so many of the things they did that it, it was almost like a fantasy. Uh, this one seemed to, you know, have some plausibility to it, for sure. So I would certainly recommend seeing this. Let me know what you guys think caused the event. If anybody's still watching this, God, this must be the longest video I've ever made. Probably longer than the darn movie itself. So sorry if I rambled on a little bit. But please uh, let me know in the comments section. I'm actually going to make a poll for this one. What do you think the disaster was that caused this doomsday scenario within this movie? I'll post the four top ones, maybe EMP, uh, military, war, whatever. And I'll leave one category for other for you to expound your ideas on in there. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. Go check out CanadianPreparedness.com for all your survival and preparedness needs. Thanks for watching. Canadian Prepper out.